ship smile on him with love while angels are singing sweet songs from above let's do 108 this one's fun because we can Work on our dynamics, all right? Let's have fun with it. While by the sheep we watched at night, glad tidings brought an angel bright. How great our joy, great our joy. Joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven. child today how great our joy and joy 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 and praise we the lord in heaven on high all right and there shall the child lie in a stall this child shall Redeem us all, how great our joy. Joy, joy, joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. How about one more? One eleven. sick those of you who are and came anyway stay away I'm just kidding I'm one of those actually I was sick earlier in the week and uh, Monday and Tuesday was really rough and uh, now now it's the end of the week I'm just dealing with the drainage but I won't be shaking hands and hugging today as much as I want to and I won't at the end be shaking hands as people leave which really I hate because that's one of my favorite parts of the day um, so I might have to get a stand in to stand back here so you guys don't feel like we're just leaving you out in the dust. But thank you for coming. I was just joking about the, the sick ones that came. I mean, kind of. I mean, keep your distance, but we, 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 want, we want you here. If you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time in front of you, you'll find a welcome card, communication card. And we just ask that you fill that out with as much information as you're comfortable with. And... Uh, 
take that back to the back to Kathleen at the uh, welcome station and she'll give you a gift just for choosing to worship with us today. The other thing that we'd love to give you is a Bible. If you don't have a copy of God's Word in front of you, you'll find a blue Bible and we want, that, we want you to make that your own if you don't have one um, or one that you understand. Uh, these are easily, easy to understand. They're, uh, they re- retain some uh, academic qualities, but it's readable. So uh, take one of those with you. Make notes in it. Dog ear the pages and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing is, when I'm preaching here in just a minute, I'll be making page references so you can so I make it easy fo- easy to follow along, which we want you to do as as we do this. Okay. Um, I'm looking through the announcements. Shay texted me yesterday. She's like, what's the announcements? And I forgot to text her back, so I apologize for that. Um, so I'm going to give them to you this way. Here's, here's the three announcements. Number one is I'm starting a, um, a Facebook group and a text group, one or the other. You can be in one or the other, um, to read the Bible in a year and to have some accountability. And I found a, a Bible that uh, one of my friends on Facebook actually posted about it, and I was like, that looks interesting. I'm going to try it. Um, but it it's breaks it down to where you can read it in a year, but it's chronological. So you're reading through it chronologically, which if your brain is anything like mine, that's how I like to understand the narrative. That's how I like to understand God's story is chronologically. So um, the Bible that we're using is called the uh, Day-by-Day Chronological Bible. It is a Christian Standard Bible. It used to be called the Holman Christian Standard. Holman's the publishing company. Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good uh, translation. I'm okay with it. Um, but anyway, if you order it on Amazon, it's 20 bucks for the paperback, $40 for the fake leather one. Um, I, the fake leather one's pretty nice. I'm going to tell you, I got, that's the one I got. Um, our goal is to start reading next Monday, not tomorrow, a week from tomorrow. And the goal of it being in a group is so that we have accountability. A lot of times people at the beginning of the year make the resolution, oh, I'm going to read the Bible in a year. And then they fall off because they lack accountability. Well, the group will help take care of that. Hey, Josie, I'm trying to talk up here and I can hear you talking. Sit down. (laughs) So anyway, um, that's going to start on Monday, and then if you're in one of the groups, basically what we're going to do is when you read through the section, just make a quick comment on, the, on that day's post to say, here's my takeaway. You know, something that jumps out at you, it doesn't matter what it is. It might be, you know, uh, an aha moment that you have with the scriptures, you know, that happens if you read God's word. Amen? Right? There might be something that you understand differently. The Holy Spirit gives you some discernment. You know, whatever it is. Share that in the group. Now, you're not compelled to share. You don't have to share in the group, but it adds to the accountability if you make the commitment to do that. I'm not going to call people out and say, hey, I haven't heard from you. What's your takeaway? I'm not going to do that, all right? It's not a, uh, a spoon feed group, and I'm not posting all my takeaways on there so that you can just copy off of those and act like you read it. Ain't going to work. Amen? So I invite anybody that wants to be a part of that, here's what I want you to do. If you're friends with me on Facebook, send me a message on Facebook. Just say, I'm in. If you, Dan, would you put my number on the board? Um, If you want to be a part of the text group, Dan's going to put my telephone number, which you all should have already, uh, on the board. And you can just text me the words, I'm in. And your name, because I might not have your number saved. So put your name and just say, I'm in. And let me know. Um, We're trying to get them ordered like... Today, tomorrow, you know, so that they'll be here before the 7th. You know, if you are unable to participate because of financial circumstances, um, let me know. And we'll get that covered as well. Okay? Um, So we'll do that. And uh, I want to be able to make this available to everybody. Reading God's word is never a bad thing. So... That's one, one of the first announcement. Second announcement is um, we've been doing Wednesday night services uh, for a little while, and one of the reasons that we've been doing Wednesday night services is because of the lack of small groups. I want, we want to get back to the small group format because um, 
it, it's, there's something special about studying God's word in the home of one of the people that you fellowship with, you know, people that you go to church with, people that you are doing this ride together with. And so um, as of right now, what I would like to do is I would like to start February 1st um, back to our small group format. In order to do that, you have to have people that are willing to open their homes to host small groups. And one of the, uh, traditionally, one of the issues with that is people are generally willing to open their homes, but they're scared to death to lead a Bible study. Well, we take out the, I can make it extremely easy on you. Like, really easy. Um, but what I need is for people to volunteer to open up their homes to host Bible studies. So, if you would be one who would, would be willing to open up your home to host a Bible study, then... Um, I would like you to reach out to me to let me know that you're willing to do that. This is what I don't want. What I don't want is I'm willing to host a Bible study for these people. Let us do that, right? Trust us with that. I'm a pastor. It's my job to shepherd. That's what I do. I'll put you in the right stalls. Amen? <laughs> so uh, if you're willing to host a Bible study, let me know. We're trying to work out the format, and we're even trying to work it out to where if you just absolutely are 100% opposed to leading a Bible study, we'll try to make it to where as long as you host, we'll have somebody come and lead it. You know, that's what we're trying to do. So if you're willing, just let me know, and uh, we'll try to get this thing started uh, as quick, quick and fast and in a hurry as we possibly can because there, every Bible study that I've ever been in in someone's home has been a huge benefit to all who are involved. I, I, I mean, literally, I don't know of anybody that's ever walked away from home Bible study like, you know, this is absolutely terrible. I hate this. I'm never going to do it again. That's not usually the way it works. Um, I'm not saying that it's never happened, but usually those are because of human interactions that can be pulled. Yeah, if we got multiple studies, I could be like, all right, that one didn't work. Go over here. You know. So if you're willing, let me know. Also, um, that extends to Sunday morning as well. You know, uh, our, we have one adult Sunday school class right now. And they're an awesome class, and they, you know, do great and enjoy each other's company and learn and all that kind of stuff, great discussion. They were having great discussion as I came in today, and I got to participate in that for just a minute. But we need, we need more, you know, available. Um, in order for us to have more available, especially for people that have kids, then we have to offer things for kids during that time as well. So I'm just laying it out here so you guys know what we're trying to do in this coming year, right? I could either do it this way or I could do a, a vision casting sermon. I'm not doing that. I'm just letting you know. This is not a corporation, it's a family. And so um, what we're doing is we're wanting to expand Sunday school. If you'd be interested in teaching Sunday school or interested in you know, and, and that adult to kids or helping in that area in some way. If you're just like one of those people that's just like, whatever you need, Josh, I'll do it. I love those people for sure, right? Um, let me know so that we can get this thing going, okay? And expand um, the times that we're together, together studying God's word. You know what I mean? I think that a lot of times, especially when we have like one service a week and there's nothing else, then we start to treat um, our gathering and Christianity and God like we do the Wendy's drive through You know, we pull in, we put, place our order, we get what we want. We're like, oh, pastor messed up my order, you know, whatever. And then we go on about our business. And that's not what the Bible prescribes. It also, that's not what the Bible describes, and it's not what the Bible prescribes. So when you get down to business coming into this year and, uh, and expand um, what we do in terms of studying the Bible and gathering together. Okay? All right, is that enough tongue wagging for that? Next, next week, uh, youth group's going to start back up, so that'll be a good time. Um, we do have a new sign-up sheet to help with rides for Julie, so if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd ask you to uh, sign up for that so we can make sure that we get her taken care of. Um, that's a good question. We need to take these decorations down because um, Christmas is over. Uh, 
I, I would invite um, whoever can today to get everything out of the sanctuary that we can, minus the tree, leave the tree. Um, anything that's left over from today, we'll finish off next week. Okay? And I think that's all the announcements. Nope. I, the, I, saved, the, I saved the important one for the big one. Not the most, I mean, they're all important. January 8th, on Thursday, January 8th, there's going to be another women's dinner at the Springboro Bob Evans. And you can let uh, Missy Thompson or Barb Moore know uh, that you're coming just so they can have a good head count. Okay? That's January the 18th, 6 o'clock at Springboro Bob Evans. All right. Take this time. Two minutes. Hug somebody's neck. Shake their hand unless you're sick. If you're sick, just kind of let people know. You know, stay back. I love you. Good to see you. You know, do the finger guns, whatever. And if you don't like people in your space, just stay seated.
Right, guys, be seated.
Sorry, Dan. Dan's like, uh, you gonna turn your mic on, bud? Sorry. John chapter five, for those of you who are watching uh, online and maybe have missed it, page 986 in the Blue Bible is where we're gonna be. But we're gonna, we're gonna yeah, like I said, we're gonna end this year the same way we rang it in, and that's with going through uh, the life of Jesus. I was praying about that and about what to preach today and whether or not I should do some kind of a vision casting sermon or, you know, some of that, that nature. I don't rule that stuff out. You know, I want to be led by the Spirit. Um, and God just really impressed upon me that uh, it may be a new year, but the same God. And uh, it may be a new year, but we got the same Savior. And, you know, the gospel is the most important thing every year. So we're just going to get straight to that. All right? As soon as I get my glasses. <sighs> You'd think after, like, forgetting them every week, that one week I would remember them. Nah. There we go. John chapter 5 and... Uh, we're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to get through probably uh, verse 18 uh, today. And then we'll address the rest of it next time or another time. I'm going to read through the text. And uh, it's an awesome text. I'm going to tell you, for some of you, um, you may be reading a translation that you're going to notice that when we come to... Uh, verse 3, at the end of verse 3 and verse 4, um, they, I'm, I won't read those verses. And the reason is because they're not in the English Standard Version of the Bible and most modern translations. And there's a reason for it. Now, some people, you know, pipe up and they'll say, oh, they're, they're changing God's Word. They're taking stuff out of God's Word. No, what they're doing and have done is acknowledge that those texts weren't originally in God's Word. And that's the issue. So we don't have any manuscripts um, from before 400 A.D. that include the end of verse 3 and verse 4. That means in those earliest manuscripts, it wasn't in there, which means it was added later. I'm not saying that what is added is false. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying it's not in the original text. And that happens in, in the text ever so often. We'll come across scriptures that are like that. Just know that I would not, I would not teach from a version that omitted God's word arbitrarily. You know, at all. Not even arbitrarily. At all. If I believe that it was omitting God's word. This is the historical precedent that's been set. And so we're going to go with what was in the original text as best we can, as often as we can. So I wanted to throw that out there so that, you know, there's nothing hanging around in the room later. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. Some speculate that this feast that it's referring to is Passover. Um, however, John doesn't tell us that. It just says it's one of the feasts, right? And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed col colonnades. Now, recent archaeological discovery has actually discovered these colonnades in this pool. It's actually two pools that combined into one, and those colonnades are present. So you can go and look online at the archaeological discovery in the colonnades, which means, you know, roof columns. Um, it's cool. You know, I want you to understand that this is, God's word is accurate. Amen? It's accurate. And when archaeological discoveries like this happen, uh, we want to acknowledge them. The other thing is, uh, the word Bethesda is a Greek transliteration of a Hebrew or Aramaic name that means um, house of outpouring. House of outpouring. I'm throwing that in there because what happens next? It's cool, Right? This is what it says. It says, verse 3 again, Now there 
there is in Jerusalem, or is that verse 2? That's verse 2. That number is really small. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you're well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working, my father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The first thing that I want to point out is when I read this, there is in it a question that on the surface seems absurd. You know what the question is? Do you want to be healed? Duh! You know what I mean? Why, why do you think I'm here? So that I can hang out with other invalids? You know, because the company's so great. Misery loves company. You know, that's on the surface. That's when I read that, I'm like, why would Jesus ask that? And in and, and reading it, then you discover the purpose and the reason that Jesus asked the question. When he, you, this man has been an invalid for 38 years. 38 years years in desperation he goes to the pool at Bethesda this house of outpouring and he was doing what all the other invalids and lame and sick were doing at the time it was a spiritual thing to do right it was the spiritual thing to do and there was something about it that seemed supernatural and he had been there a long time before Jesus comes and asks that question. That seems absurd on the surface. Do you want to be healed? But the question has a purpose. And that question, why would he ask that question? Here it is. To get his attention. Amen? You got to think about it for a second. He's been there for a long time. Now it says, in some translations it says when Jesus learned that he'd been there a long time, first of all, understand that Jesus, the, the implication in the original text, in the original language, is that he knows currently. So that's the reason why it's been translated now as Jesus knew he'd been there a long time. I expect that Jesus, the Son of God, all-knowing, would know that he's been there a long time. And I'm going to tell you this. He, you, you may not have even had to use any sense of supernatural ability to know that he'd been there a long time. You could probably see it all over his face. Right? I mean, in desperation, he's laying by this pool. Can you imagine laying by this pool for hours on end? Maybe days, years, months. I mean, who, I don't know how long that he's come to this pool or how long he's been there that day, but he lays by this pool and then the water stirs and then it's like they believed and the tradition tells us that the first one that would get down into this water would be healed. And he has no way to beat everybody out. 
because he's an invalid. Can you imagine this person's predicament at this time when Jesus walks up? Probably hopeless. He was probably hopeless by this point. He's looking around. He's seeing all this. and this, he's like, I don't have any. I mean, he, he tells us about it in his answer. Every time I try, I can't get down there. I'm alone. Nobody, nobody here to, you know, put me down into the water. Right? So in this moment, he's likely focused on a couple of things. He's focused on the fact that he's an invalid and has been for 38 years and that now there's no hope. He's looking around at the people around them, at the people that are, that are, are going to beat him next. Imagine that. Right? And he's seeing them. And in that moment, it's easy to get lost in the affliction. Isn't it? When you're suffering, it's easy to get lost in the affliction. And so Jesus comes and he asks the question. Do you want to be healed? There's a, there's a spiritual implication to this too, by the way. When it comes to the, to the, the spiritual world, you know, the Bible is, essentially tells us that there's two reasons that people aren't healed. And the two reasons are, number one, they don't want to recognize that they're sick. Or number two, they enjoy it. Right? That's why people aren't, aren't healed of their sin. You know, I'm, talking, I'm just talking in spiritual terms now. And there's spiritual undertones to this whole thing. Right? There's, there's, there's that world at play in this whole thing. But generally speaking, and it tells us, I'll give you the, I'll give you the scripture reference. Specifically. So that you can go look at it and you know that I'm not just making stuff up. One of them's in the book of Isaiah. Did I write it down? Isaiah chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. Sometimes we don't find healing because we don't recognize we're sick. You can look at that at your own leisure. You can look at it right now. Sometimes we're not healed because we don't want to be. And Jesus said that it's not the, it's not the well who need a doctor, right? It's the sick. In this man's case, when Jesus asked this question, do you want to be healed? Then he's, te- he's taking care of one of those, right? One of those issues. He's saying, do you have the desire to be healed? Do you really want to be healed? And when he does that, he snaps that guy's attention off of all the people that are going to beat him the next trip into the pool, off of the fact that he's been an invalid for 38 years, off of the, the struggle and the day and the wear and tear um, emotionally and spiritually and physically on his body of just being there and onto the Savior. Amen? Listen, I don't care what, listen. If you're in the midst of struggling, you're in the midst of affliction, you're in the midst of a trial, Focus on Jesus. You know what I mean? Focus all of your attention on Jesus. It's, it's easy to say, hard to do. Amen? It's easier said than done sometimes, especially when the affliction's great and it's lasted a long time and you're alone and Satan's had his way with you for some time. You know, I get it. Been there, done that. You know what I mean? But if we're focusing on the hole that we're in, we are not focusing on the solution, which is Christ every time. Amen? So when he asked the question, I mean, you think anybody else asked him that question that day? No. Nah. Probably as long as he's been coming. The implication that the fact that he is there shows that he wants to be healed. He has the desire. What he doesn't have is the means. Amen? Put your focus on Jesus. The affliction may be great, it might be long-lasting, but your focus has to be on Christ. Number two, verse seven. It says, the sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus tells him, get up, take his bed, and walk. I love that, by the way. He can't physically get into the water. Listen, listen to this point. The first point is to put your focus on Jesus. The second point is that your ability and your friends aren't enough, but Jesus is. It seems obvious, but I want to state the obvious. Because a lot of times, you know, people try to over-spiritualize the reading of the scripture. 
it literally, most times, it means exactly what it says. And there's not some hidden thing in the background, right? And what does he say? He says, my abilities aren't enough, right? When I try to get down in the water, other people beat me to it, right? He doesn't have any friends. He's alone. And it, think about it. Even if he had a friend, that, that's not a guarantee. You know what I mean? If I was sick like that and I had the ability to get close to the water, I'd get to almost touching it. You know what I mean? I'd be like a contestant on Jeopardy. As soon as that water, I don't care if it was the wind. Oh, sorry. False start. You know, you know what I mean? Wouldn't you? He doesn't have that ability. And even if he had the friends there to help him, no guarantee of success. Because our ability and our friend's ability isn't enough. But Jesus' ability is always enough. Listen, I can't earn my way to heaven. My ability does not, is, is not enough. My friends can't drag me into heaven. Amen? I wish they could. That would have made life a lot easier for me back in the day. If I, if I found some Christian friends that would do it, you know. But their ability is not enough. But Jesus is absolutely enough. He's more than enough. Amen? He can't get in the water because of his own strength and abilities are insufficient. And he has no one to rely on. He's there. He's abandoned probably by family and friends. He's desperate. He's weak. And he's alone. But then Jesus showed up. And he said, do you want to be healed? This man has the desire, but he lacks the means. And Jesus tells him, get up, take your bed, and walk. Now, in the theme that I talked about on Christmas, you know, Christmas Eve and, and the week before, I talked about how the, the coming of the Messiah had been prophesied about 700 years before the, the actions happened. And I gave an example of that in Isaiah chapter 53 and about what it said about Jesus' death and about his life, Right? This, this event is also prophesied about. It tells us about it specifically in the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 1 through 7. It tells us that in the days of the Messiah, the lame would leap like a deer. Amen? You're like, well, Josh, I mean, technically speaking, it doesn't say that he leapt like a deer. I bet he did. Wouldn't you? If you've been lame for 38 years and all of a sudden this dude comes up and says, you want to be healed? And you're like, yeah, I just don't have the ability. Then he's like, get up and walk. And then you get up and walk. You think you wouldn't jump up and down and test out those new legs? I'd be testing them out. If God was just like, you know, Josh, I know your back's been hurting. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to heal you. I'd be like, all right, God. And then if he, if he said it's healed and it was healed, you know what I'd do? I'd go out and find the biggest log I could. Right? I'd lift that thing up. I wouldn't even use my legs probably. You know what I mean? I mean, all back. That's what I'd be doing. Testing that thing out. You think he'd jump, he'd jump like a deer? I guarantee he probably did. But one thing's for certain is he got up, he took up his bed, and he walked. I'm going to tell you why. Because when Jesus gives a command, it comes along with the enablement to do the command. You know what I mean? Sometimes, listen, a lot of times, when we look at the commands of God, we're like, that's, that's, that's too much for me. That's too big for me. I'm going to tell you that God would not have commanded it of you without giving you and enabling you to perform it. Amen? You're like, well, what about sin? Well, he gives us the Holy Spirit. Right? What does the Holy Spirit do? guides us. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does, guide us. Right? If you followed the Holy Spirit and his guidance, would you go into temptation? I don't think so. God doesn't lead into temptation, does he? As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Jesus prayed when he told us how to pray. Lead us not into temptation. Isn't that what he said? Did he say that because God leads us into the temptation? No, but sometimes where we go, temptation happens to be. 
And if he leads us into temptation, does he expect us then to fall once we meet the temptation? No, he gives us an out. That's what his word says. That's one of the things that people a lot of times misquote the scriptures and they're like, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. False. It's not what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, the one who put the pen to paper to write this text, John, was given more than he could handle several times. Amen? He was boiled in oil. Think you can handle that? <laughs> what about the other guys? Paul had his head chopped off. You think he could handle that? No. But God can. God will never give you anything more than he can handle, which is the enablement that we're talking about when it comes to here. It would have been cruel. Listen to me. It would have been cruel for Jesus to say to this man, get up and walk without giving him the ability to do so. Wouldn't that have been cruel? Right? When God gives you a command, he gives you the ability to follow it. Now, sometimes because of our own unwillingness to surrender, our own unwillingness to follow the guide, we mess up. And I'm not saying anything, you know, about that. I'm not talking about, I'm not a perfectionist. You guys know that, right? Perfectionism is when you believe that once you get saved, you, you know, you'll never sin anymore. Well, I'm not one of those guys. That's not how I've experienced it in my life, just so you know. Amen? Even since the Lord has, has, has saved me and forgiven me of my sin, I've committed other sins. Spoiler alert, he forgave me of those too. Praise God, right? But when he gives you a command, he gives you the ability to follow the command, and he says, get up and walk, and then the guy does. You imagine that guy in that moment, 38 years. The muscles that had not been used, that had been lying dormant for 38 years, all of a sudden work. The joints that had not been used, that didn't work for 38 years, now work. The ligaments now work after 38 years, and he got up and he walked. And another thing that I want to tell you about this, is that I know you're probably sick of me saying it, but I'm going to say it, and that is that when God heals, he heals completely, amen? It didn't say, but he got up and walked with a limp. It didn't say that he got, he got up but walked with a hunchback. It didn't say you know, he couldn't walk very fast. He had to shuffle his feet like he bought a pair of slippers from Walmart and didn't take the little plastic thing off. You know what I mean? That's a Mark Lowry joke that I just stole completely. <coughs> you know what I mean? He was healed completely. He got up and he walked. Praise God for that. Listen, your abilities aren't enough. Your friend's abilities aren't enough. But Jesus is always enough. The third thing that I want to point out is that legalism always misses the Messiah. Legalism always misses the Messiah. Look how they, how they missed it here. Now that was the Sabbath day, verse 9, the end of verse 9. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man that said that to you? Take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn because there was a crowd in the place. Legalism always misses the Messiah. Listen, it tells us right out the gate it was the Sabbath. Why does it tell us that it was the Sabbath? Because that was their accusation. That was their beef. Their beef was that this dude's carrying his bed on the Sabbath day. How dare he? He should have laid there for another 38 years. You know, or at least until the following day so that he could get up. No, listen, this was the tradition. It's not in the Old Testament, but it was in their tradition. The way that they taught when it come to the Sabbath was that it was illegal for you to carry anything from a public place to a private place. It was illegal. And you know what the recommended punishment for it was? Stoning. Legalism. What are they talking about? They're talking about the Sabbath. Well, Jesus, I mean, God told us about the Sabbath. What did he tell us about it? The Sabbath was made for man. Amen? Amen. 
It was made for man. Amen? You guys following along? Right. I wrote down the passage. I want to make sure. Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. It teaches us that Sabbath was made for man. It was made for us for what purpose? So that we could rest and that we could worship. That's why. Is this man, you think this man was worshiping? Well, as he's carrying, he's been lame for 38 years. Some of y'all ain't even that old. Can you imagine your whole life not being able to walk? Being an invalid, not being able to take care of yourself, not being able to get up to go to the bathroom. Think about all the shame that came along with that. Without, the, without not having the ability, there's that baby. <laughs> That's awesome. Miracle of God right there. Just walk down the aisle. That's showing off your baby. Yeah, look at there. Praise God. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Happens. Praise God for that, though. Amen. Miracle of God. He's a life giver. But can you imagine 38 years, and this guy gets up, and he's not praising God? I guarantee he was. I guarantee he was with every step. Every step. Right? But they're hung up on this teaching this tradition their legalism that goes actually beyond the scope of what God prescribed and I'm going to tell you something that any of God's commands that you expound on and take further than what God intends is sin isn't it you're saddling people with stuff that they shouldn't be saddled with if God doesn't saddle me with it you don't have any right to Amen? But he did it on the Sabbath day. This guy's carrying his thing on the Sabbath day. They're like, stop! Uh, that's illegal. Why are you carrying your, why are you walking and carrying your bed on the Sabbath day? I'm going to tell you why. I know your tradition. Yeah, I guarantee he knew about that. He knew he wasn't supposed to pick that up and walk with it. He, this is where he grew up. 38 years he's been there. Right? And he does it anyway. Why? Because the one who healed me told me to amen in other words I don't care about your legalism I don't care about your rules I care about what he told me because he's the one that healed me and if he's got the power to heal me and it happens to be on a Sabbath day he tells me to get up and walk and it happens to be on a Sabbath day then I'm going to walk on a Sabbath day and if he told me that I need to get up and run a marathon I'm going to get up and run a marathon and if he told me that I had to do 150 push ups I'd be pushing up on the Sabbath day. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's serious talk. That's real talk. Legalism, they missed it. Jesus is right there. The thing that was prophesied about 700 years earlier, that the lame would leap, is happening right before their eyes, and they miss it because of their tradition. They miss it because of their legalism. They miss it because of their pride. They miss it because of their pompous, whatever. Let me stop there. It ain't right to even cuss the Pharisees. I wouldn't do that. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen? And they missed it. Listen, people. If there's, think about this. If you're a Christian, don't let your tradition, don't let your legalism bind you up so much that you're missing what God's doing. You know what I mean? We get, we get so bound up in what we think we know. And there's so, much that of, there's so much of religion that is not of God, that is of man, that has been brutalizing people for generations. That if we don't keep that stuff in check, we'll miss what God's doing. Amen? I mean... I have been to places. I'm, I'm going to try to be careful to, you know, parse my words. You know, I don't want to, you know, offend unnecessarily. But I've been in places and in the midst of people who call themselves Christians. 
I get so bent out of shape because somebody comes in off the streets and they're not doing the Christian-y thing that these Christians say that that person's supposed to be doing. And they don't even know if they're saved. I think we get so wrapped up in expecting the world to act like us. It wastes so much time and energy. You know what I mean? The world's going to act like the world. That's what the world does. We're the ones who are supposed to be different. We're the ones that are supposed to be set apart. We're not supposed to be pointing our fingers at them. We're supposed to be leading them to Christ. You know what I mean? We are getting away from like it was back in the day. Back in the day when I was growing up in church, like you knew Christians by their haircuts, especially ladies. You could identify them. They were all similar. You know what I mean? You might have been guilty of this. That's fine. It's your thing. If you want your hair to be like theirs, it's fine. But I, listen, I don't care how your hair is fixed. I don't care if you walk in off the streets and you're a woman and you've got a mohawk. I don't care. People get all, you used to get so hung up on tattoos. I don't care a thing about tattoos. You know what I care about? I care about whether or not that person has given their life to Jesus Christ. That's what I care about. Because I would much rather them go to, go to heaven with tattoos on their arms than go to hell wearing a suit. Amen. Don't get wrapped up in this legalism stuff. Because if you'll do, you'll miss the work, the, the work of God. And, and, and this has been an example for us since Jesus was here. And probably before. Jesus sees him. You know, that's the whole... The thing about it all, this is what legalism does, right? Who's called the accuser in the scriptures? Who is it? Satan, Satan that's exactly right. He's the accuser. And what legalism does is it takes you from worshiping and rejoicing to accusing. Amen? Isn't that what it does? See, look at, look at them, watch them. They're, they're breaking God's command. Do you see that? Stop. Don't miss the Messiah. Verse 14. It says, Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, See, you're well. Imagine that. <laughs> I wish I was there for that part. You know what I mean? Like Jesus walking up, Hey, look, you're better. You know what I mean? Isn't that cool? That's, I, I love these little nuggets about Jesus. It tells us about his personality when he's here on earth with us. You know, see, you're well. Like, gotcha. You know what I mean? That's how I read it. You might read it different. You might read it all reverent and, you know, see, you are well. It's not how I read it. He was lost in the crowd, right? Jesus, Jesus backed out of the crowd, didn't he? He didn't even know who the guy was that healed him because Jesus kind of melted off into the crowd like, all right, I'm, you know, they're, they're starting to, I imagine there was a crowd. This dude laid invalid for 38 years. Jesus comes and says, get up and walk. And the guy does. Everybody around there who's waiting to tap the water is like, hold up. <laughs> you know, let's talk to this guy. You know what I mean? So imagine there was a crowd for sure. And then he backs off. And then later on, after everything's kind of, you know, settled down, the focus is in a different place. He walks up. See, you're well. Got him. I love that. That's how I read it. Rejoice in the miracle. See, you're well. Sin no more. Listen, this part, this part gets left off in this telling a lot of times. Sin no more. That nothing worse may happen to you. Sin no more so that nothing worse will happen to you. What would be worse than laying 38 years as an invalid? I'm going to tell you what it is. Hell. Wouldn't hell be worse? Yeah, listen. This kind of goes back to what I just mentioned in my excitement it's better to live as a cripple and go to heaven than an Olympic gold medalist and go to hell 
Amen. All the, that gold medal, that's temporary, isn't it? That fame, temporary. The ability, temporary. Right? I was watching, uh, everybody's making a big stink about a guy whose career was over and now has been revived, a uh, football player for the Browns now, Joe Flacco. And if you follow football, and, he, and I, I started to, like last year, a little bit more. And again, this year, I've been watching a little bit of it. And uh, Ashley's a Browns fan, and I never have been. And most, most of the time, I don't like Browns fans. No offense. Because uh, I grew up as a Bengals fan. Second. Bears first, Bengals second. My third favorite team is whoever's playing Dallas. So if you're a Dallas fan, I don't apologize. <coughs> But I was reading about <clears throat> Dallas, or I mean, Cleveland lost their quarterback. Paid this guy all kinds of money, all that kind of stuff, and then he ain't played very much all year for him. Which, I mean, would you if, you, if you could sit on the sidelines and make tons of money, why would you ever play a game? Get hit by 300-pound men all the time. That's not going to happen. I'll just sit on the bench and watch. You can pay me the money. Well, that's the route that he took. And so he's on the bench, and it looked like their season was through because their backup quarterback just wasn't cutting it. And then I read a report. A, a, a guy said, it wasn't a report, it was some dude said, you're not going to believe this, but I just ran into Joe Flacco at Cleveland Airport, and I asked him what he was doing here, and he says, don't worry, you'll read it in the papers in the next couple of days. And so they signed Joe Flacco, and I was like, that could work, because he's, they're a good defensive team. And Flacco's a good clock manager type of quarterback, which is what every good defensive team needs. Ask the Chicago Bears. Right? And then he comes in and he does the job. And he's doing the job. And he's doing the job better than he did it before. And they're like, you know, so surprised. He's 37 years old. It ain't like the dude's dead and, you know, or, you know, it's not like he's like had to give up a social security check so he could sign with the NFL. You know, he's 37. And when, in, well, I, I use this as an example to tell you that they're treating him like he voted for Lincoln. And he's 37 because the ability, the athletic ability, fades. And it fades quickly. Amen? So, what is better for the invalid? For the invalid, it is better to know Christ than to, to pick up your bed and walk. Amen? But Jesus gave him both. He said, here you go. Get up and walk. He healed him. And then he said, go and sin no more. And a lot of times we get so focused on the healing and the miracle that we forget about that little command that comes afterwards. Go and sin no more. Because he says that a number of times. As a matter of fact, one of the times is the adulterous woman. Right? He says it to her too. Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Right? Why is that important for us? I want to tell you why. Because Jesus didn't just accept her lifestyle. He didn't conform to her lifestyle. He expected her and this gentleman to conform to him. Amen? That's what the scripture tells us, that we're to be conformed to the image of Christ. Amen? Not the other way around. He says, go and sin no more, because it's better to die with Christ than to die without him. That's the worst thing that can happen, because hell's forever. Athletic ability, riches, fame, all that kind of stuff is temporary. I don't know that Jesus was thinking about the Olympics and Joe Flacco when he said that, but you get the gist. The last thing it says in verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath. Man, they're so stuck on that. Amen? It's like every chance they get, oh, your guys, they, 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 they grabbed a little... Uh, seed on their way through a field and ate on the Sabbath. That's work. You ain't allowed to do that. Y'all need to be stoned. You know, <laughs> like they're always hung up on this Sabbath because of their legalist pride. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. Now think about that for just a second. He had the audacity to call his dad dad. Why was that so egregious? Because it made him equal with God. You want to know who Jesus is? I want to tell you who Jesus is. He is equal with God. Because in the beginning was the Word. 
and the word was with God, and the word was God. Amen? He's not just equal with him. It's, it's not just that they stand on the same plane. It's that he is God. Amen? That burned their biscuits when you say something like that for those people in that time. But I'm going to tell you that it's the truth. He is the one and only who can save you from the disease of sin, from your infirmities. And those infirmities, that sin, that, that illness that you've been afflicted with since your birth, you're, you're a sinner, and you sin because you're a sinner, not the other way around, right? Because you're a sinner, because you suffer from that affliction, Jesus came as the only one who could tell you, get up, grab your mat, and walk to heal you of your sin. He's the only one that can do that. There is no other way. If there were another way, he would have told us that there is another way. But he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. There is no one who comes to the Father but by me. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, if you haven't given your life to the Christ, Jesus our Lord, then it's because of one of two reasons. You refuse to acknowledge that you're sick or you enjoy your sin too much and you don't want to give it up. But he offers you healing. And if you're willing to understand who you really are, that you are really a sinner that needs a savior, that needs a Jesus because you can't do it under your own ability. You can't do it under your friend's ability. Only Jesus is enough. Then give him your life. Give him your life. If you love him more than you love your sin, give him your life. If you want to be healed, give your life. Surrender it over completely to him. Focus on him and be healed. Amen? You're like, well, I don't know if God can heal me because I've heard some Christians say X, Y, Z. I don't care what other Christians have said. What I care about is thus saith the Lord. And what he says is, whosoever shall call upon my name, that's you, I don't care if you're Mohawk tattooed, you know, what your past is. I don't care, you know, any of that kind of stuff. You count as a whosoever. Amen? That's a direct translation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't say you might be. Doesn't say you could be. Doesn't say you're going to be put in a queue and then eventually you, you, you'll get saved. It says you shall be saved immediate, right now, if you surrender your life over to him. So I invite you to do that because he's the one that came. And live the life you couldn't. The son of God. Equal to God because he is God. Amen? Died on the cross to, as a penalty, to pay the penalty for your sin so that you could have life and have life eternally. And an abundant life while you're here. So if you'd like that, then I invite you right now, where you're at, or you can come up here and pray with me. Whatever. You make it right with God. Tell him you're a sinner. That you need to be saved. Give him your life. Repent of your sin. Leave it where it's at. Turn away from it. Change your mind about it. Get, get it out of your life by giving it over to him. And surrender your life to Christ and be saved. Today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Lord, if the goal of today was to present your gospel, I pray that we've done that have done that in a in such a way as understandable and accurate in accordance with your word. Lord, you're uh, you're awesome. I couldn't imagine being one of the disciples, you know, or somebody there in the crowd and seeing this man suffer and languish, knowing that there wasn't anything I could do about it. And then you come out of nowhere. Tell him to get up and walk, and he does. I can't imagine the adulation, the joy. But in a way, I can. <laughs> because I languished a long time in my sin. A long time. 
And Lord, it was crushing. It was a heavy weight to bear. And when I think about it still today, Lord, it starts to choke me because it's so restrictive. It's bondage. But Lord, when you saved me, you lifted that burden. You lifted that weight. Now I'm free. And for that, I give you glory and honor and praise. I may not jump around, leap like a deer, but Lord, my heart does for sure because of what you've done for me. And you know that. And Lord, I know that there's some of us here that have been guilty in the past. And I know that I have of getting so focused and hyper-focused on our rules and traditions that we've missed your work amongst us. For those, for those times, Lord, I, I ask that you forgive me. And Lord, as you convict those who are here that are your children, Lord, I pray that all of us, we would repent of those things. And that when you move, we would, we would rejoice with those upon whom you move when you tell somebody to, to stand up, to get up and take their mat, Lord, I pray that we would come along with them, jump up and down and celebrate their healing. And Lord, I know that there's some here and with an earshot of my voice that either A, don't want to really recognize, don't want to acknowledge the fact that they are sick with sin, that they're sin sick and that it leads to death. They don't want to acknowledge it. There's some that are so in love with their sin that they just don't want to give it up. Lord, I pray for those. I pray that you would soften their hearts, Lord, that you would chisel away that wall that's around them, the stone, and Lord, that you would pierce them to the very core of who they are, that they would surrender their life to you, that they would repent of their sin, that they would get saved, and that they would see healing in this life and in eternity with the eternal life that you promise us. Lord, that's my prayer. And I pray that no one would leave here without knowing you today. And we ask these things, these great things, these big, huge, miraculous things in the name of the one who does the miracles, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Hey, don't forget, I'll ask you to put my number back up on the board just in case anybody missed the announcement earlier, but we're starting a read through the Bible in a year.